What is up, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Anti-Gravity Group Podcast. My name is Braden Carlson. I'm Taylor Jesse. And my name is Shane, or as you might know me, Postart. And today we are diving into tracking. But first, we have a couple of housekeeping things we need to address here. Um, the Punisher Fund merch, including the Nigel the Rocket Cat merch, is now out in full force. We've got Nigel the Rocket Cat glasses like beer glasses and wall tapestries and shirts and hoodies and even some slides if you're looking for some new flip-flops and taylor needs the nigel the rocket cat cat feeding mat <laughs> um i don't Brain's think it's really been meta. pushing for that yeah, yeah it would be perfect it's so good <laughs> um but yeah so we have that up now if you go to rocketvlogs.com all of the money from these merch sales is going into the Punisher Fund so that we can fly the Punisher again at Airfest in Argonia, Kansas. Uh, we're flying it this year on an N2000, three M1297s, and three L850s for a full O white lightning extravaganza. Woof. <laughs> how how <laughs> high is it supposed to go? Uh, 15,000, I yeah. think. Which is just absurd. It's dumb. It's such a uh, big rocket. Yeah, and if and if you're uh, on the fence about checking out the uh, merch, I highly recommend it because that Nigel design is hot. <laughs> it is on fire. Um, I think it, as of now, might be the most sold merch I have. Um, I'll have to double check that because the APCP stuff did pretty good. But yeah, all of the merch sales basically from now until Airfest are all going to the Punisher Fund. So... Uh, yeah, and I guess for those not familiar, the Punisher is our 12-inch diameter rocket that's 15 feet tall and, when loaded, weighs almost 200 pounds. So 15,000 feet is pretty crazy. And you know what we're going to have this time? A functioning onboard camera. Maybe two, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> we'll, we'll just we'll put every camera we own on there, every GoPro. Dude, yep. people, I'm not kidding. I'll, like, we both have the little square ones that work perfectly on my rockets, but for some reason on the Argus <laughs> decided not to work. We can put two, three, uh, who cares? I love it when people are like, you should put some onboard video on there. I'm like, yeah, thanks for the great idea. I'm definitely not super if, mad that it didn't work. <laughs> if only we had thought of that. <laughs> that would have been so oh. brilliant. Also, uh... I don't know if I told you, but Sam is working on another Nigel design without us even asking. So, oh no oh. way! That's pretty just, crazy. She just likes drawing Nigel, I guess. So, well, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? If you have drawing <laughs> skills, he's a great uh, topic of drawing. But okay, well, we've we've dwelled long enough on this. Uh, RockyVlogs.com. Go check out the merch. And another announcement that we have is the launch, the official rollout of aggpodcast.com we have a website now woo um it just <laughs> <laughs> all it does is like it, it's a link or like a forward to the the host website that shows all of our episodes and everywhere you can find it but uh yeah it's there and what that also is bringing is a way for people who aren't on patreon to participate as well we now have the email address contact at anti... Nope. We run that back. Contact at aggpodcast.com. Uh, you can use it to send any questions or comments about the show. Um, we kind of want to integrate some sort of like a ask the rocket wizard kind of thing. Like if, for those who remember Extreme Rocketry Magazine, they had... Uh, was it Rocket Wizard? What do they call him? I can't remember now. Mm, I think so. But uh, it's you know something any like rocketry that. Really that was like the questions. back page, right? Yeah. So just any Q and A stuff about advice for rocketry and stuff like that. It's contact at aggpodcast dot com. So uh, yeah, get in there. We'll get some emails flowing, and we can have a nice conversation with you all. It'll it'll be like uh, it'll be like you're here with us doing the podcast here with us yeah <laughs> even though we are also like thousands of miles apart but you know <laughs> semantics we're on well, the screen together yes this is true That's i guess true. you're right the internet has brought us all closer 
All right. Shout well, out to the internet, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Big up. Well, not my Bill internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. Taylor's internet makes everything difficult. Uh, last week, I thought for sure his part of the podcast was just going to be gone. So that was it, it. Was a new record for poor performance on uh, yeah, it, the internet <laughs> front. It really wanted no part of Taylor participating. But anyway, today we're talking about tracking, which is something that we're not quite qualified to dive this deep into <laughs> because we all use the exact same tracking setup. Um, but it is something we're open minded to. And we have all sort of, well, so picked or already branched out to the next chapter of tracking. I think I think this year is is going to be our breakthrough to um, trying different tracking methods. Yeah. So we'll get we'll get into that, but yeah. So we're we're just going to open up with what we use for tracking. A lot of people ask <laughs> us, and it's uh, the communication specialist receiver. Um, I still have a single round 2032 transmitter from Wildman um, that hasn't been destroyed. I wanted Matt to be on the podcast because I think uh, in the past year and a half or so, three of mine have been destroyed and one of them <laughs> was him. So, but, uh, you know, seems to be a touchy subject. And uh, yeah, if you know about communication specialists, ComSpec, as most people call it, they are now out of business, out of production, and uh, the owner seemingly had no interest in anybody continuing it. Um, so it's dead in the water. There are still receivers. Um, you can get them on eBay and maybe posting in Rocket Troopers asking people to sell them for those that are moving on from them entirely. You could potentially get them. There is actually one at the time of recording this podcast on eBay right now with two transmitters, and one of them's on a cat collar. Uh, they had they called it the low catter, which is brilliant. But uh, the the guy's asking like six hundred forty eight dollars, which is actually more than all of that cost new because it's the PR one hundred, which is the lower level receiver, the one that I have and Postart as well. Yep. Yep. Mr. Rich guy over there, Taylor's got the PR three hundred. Hmm? No, I don't. Oh, never. I mind. have some some ancient stuff. Um, yeah, yours is probably a good bit older than mine. Huh? I got mine in like two thousand twelve, two thousand eleven. Yeah. So uh, when I bought my like, so I think the first com spec that was available was the Rocket Hunter, which was like maybe early 2000s and uh, I remember seeing the ads in the magazines and that's what I wanted well when it finally came time for you know my grandpa and I to get a tracker when we got to that step uh, we went to look and the rocket hunter had just been discontinued and so we went to the Comspec website found out well actually before that I just found out through talking to people people had New Comspec made the Rocket Hunter stuff, and they're like, "Oh, we'll just use this one." And I think it's a law enforcement <laughs> tracker or something, right? I don't really know, but um, it's this. It was on the same um, frequency band as the Rocket Hunter, and so it was. That's from we bought that in two thousand seven, maybe, and then shortly after that, Tim came out with the rock, or like they had, were started selling like a Rocket version again from straight from Comspec, so. Right. I got and in that on was, the weird in between phase. That was like the cheap alternative to Walston, which is uh, a classic that uh, I always liked that the Walston had like a shoulder strap and you could like put headphones in and really get precise with it. I but, feel like people always had the headphones with the Walston. Yeah. The cheap like little wire with the soft <laughs> pads that didn't look very soft. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sure there's still people rocking the Walston out there. Oh, for sure. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately discontinued. So uh, we pretty much have to move on from here because none of us have even actually flown any other tracking system. Um, the next thing we kind of have queued up is stuff that we're interested in using. Um, if anybody wants to kick that off, let her rip. Um, I would like to add just for people in that 
are listening, like if you are interested in radio tracking, you can still get stuff from um the falconry places like LL Electronics and Marshall. Um, wow, just jumping all over. This is literally on the list at the end. Unbelievable. Oh. <laughs> well, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> I asked you before we recorded if there's anything you would like to add. It's my it's man on the didn't list. even read it. Yeah, unbelievable. Oh, I didn't know that's what you meant by alternatives. Yeah, butchered. Absolutely well, butchered it. <laughs> Forget that. There's nothing available. We'll get back to that. Just imagine you live in a world of chaos where none of this if, exists. If only something else was available. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you get start off with things we're interested in? All right, well... First and foremost, um, lately I'm interested in the Fluctus because there's one sitting on the workbench in our rocket room. Um, It has some downsides, like the fact that as of now, there's no mobile support. So you're, you're bringing out a laptop. And somebody actually told me earlier today that they have issues getting it to connect if you're running Windows 11 which is now, what, seven years old or something like that? Probably not quite that old, but... Definitely uh, a few years old. Yeah, old enough that pretty much any PC you buy brand new comes with Windows 11, and my laptop has Windows 11, so I don't really plan on toting my desktop to any rocket launches. <laughs> <laughs> so that will be something I need to address. Um, but it also... I mean, it's a pretty high altitude... But I, if I recall correctly, its service ceiling is like 65,000 feet, which is, yes, that's more than enough for 90% of people in rocketry. But it is a little bit of a limiting factor if you're trying to go with some high performance stuff. And if you, for the integration of the Fluctus and also being a deployment controller and all this stuff, it seems like that's a little short of optimized for but- the market. Do they, is that the, is there actually a hard limit there or is that just what it's been tested to? And so they're advertising that. I don't think it's even been tested that high at this point. Oh. Um, I would have to review that, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like in the 60,000 range. Hmm. This is a little bit of a bummer, but the one that when people ask me, I'm like, I don't have any experience with a GPS tracking system, but the one that seems most enticing to me in terms of just like getting it and going is definitely the featherweight one. Yeah, that's I'm probably going to buy one in the next couple months. Yeah. <laughs> it just, well, for one, after, for after using a raven for the first time now i want the blue raven because i i'm feeling the magic and i like the the app that works <laughs> with both units yeah even just, just that when it was just the blue raven app i was like this is sick yeah. so now but it just it looks so well put together like the app looks like it works so well and um yeah it's very intuitive and that's what i like I'm not what you would call an electronics guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Matt's for. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I really want a featherweight one, but I am also obligated to say that I am interested in trying out Altus Metrum tracking products because I have already bought them. <laughs> um, <laughs> the the big barrier if you're not familiar with Altus Metrum is that you have to have a ham license. And it is an interesting thing because technically the transmitters are not I believe it's a power restriction. They're not powerful enough to technically require a ham license, but in order for a device to be exempt from needing a ham license apparently there is some monumental fee for getting it certified as such and being such a niche hobby with people that already don't want to spend a ton of money oh nigel the rocket cat's here (laughs) (laughs) um it wouldn't be very fiscally feasible for a small company building electronics for hobby rocket people to invest that kind of money 
I, this is all just like off the dome memory wise too. So it could all completely be wrong, but I believe somebody said it's like $15,000 per device. And that would mean every Altus Metron product that has GPS transmitting capability would need certifies be like $65,000 or something like that to get it all done, which is a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paw start. What are you trying to GPS track with? I uh I haven't really like looked a whole lot into Featherway or Altus Metrum. I I haven't looked into them enough to really like want to try either one of them. The only one that I've really been interested in is the Fluctus. But I would like for there to be a mobile app and I know that's in the works, right? Yeah, he said they were working on one because so many people requested it. So yeah. hopefully that's soon. I feel like definitely once that is a thing, I'll be a lot more interested and my wallet will be a lot more at risk. <laughs> right. Well, that's another nice thing about the Featherweight one, too, is the whole setup's like 365 bucks or 385 it, bucks. Yeah, it's absolutely absurd how reasonable it is for a product that works so well. Because it wasn't that long ago where you're like... Well, if you want to step up to GPS, you're going to drop like a thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. RDF tracking used to be the cheap option. It was more affordable to buy a $500 receiver and a hundred dollar transmitter, but times are a changing. We got to adapt, you know? Yeah. We have been very vocal on loving radio trackers and I don't intend to quit using them, but instead add to it with a different tool used in certain applications with gps <laughs> right that's kind of where i'm at i'm like this is a backup plan or rdf is a backup plan so if the gps decides to lose lock and never come back then i'm like well at least i still have an rdf tracker i know i can get it yep i enjoy the thrill of the radio track but I I must say the novelty for the first few GPS flights uh <laughs> I'm sure will be enticing as well. Yeah, you're like, "Whoa, like, oh, look, there it, it is. There it's it is exactly <laughs> right there." <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just like, especially cuz my car has Android Auto. So I'm like, I can just punch her in Android Auto and hop in the car, <laughs> get the AC rolling, and we just drive right up to it. Yeah. When Matt flew his demon for the first time, he had the um. Well, he he had a radio tracker in it, but he also had the um. What's the one you put together? Egg timer. Yeah, and he had the egg timer GPS with the connects um receiver. <laughs> I was so excited about that when he showed it to me. I was like, "Whoa, connects!" Because I was obsessed with connects <laughs> when I was younger. But he flew that rocket for the first time in an L nineteen forty, and it went crazy hard like his first flight over like a mile went like 15,000 feet <laughs> how's the gps and, do uh, i was i just remember thinking well this is funny he thinks he's gonna use his gps and it's gonna work okay and i'm like i'll show you how to use that radio tracker and because i was sort of convinced that no you know just because it's matt that maybe because I don't know if he had successfully really... He hadn't flown anything really out of sight. So I'm like, I don't know if the GPS is really working. And um, I didn't know if Matt's connects were put together correctly. So <laughs> They were connected <laughs> well. Yeah, I'm like... Then we just walked right up to it. I'm like, holy crap, that actually worked. So it was pretty fun. Yeah, and I know a lot of people have luck with the egg timer stuff. I just have... I can't explain how little interest i have in assembling my own electronics yeah i really not only do i not want to do that but also it would just me be constantly wondering if it was going to work <laughs> right yeah, yeah if, it ever, if something ever happened i'd be like well that's because i used the one i had to put together myself i don't yeah, exactly. have enough trust in myself for that it's so the components are so small. I don't want anything to do with it. And I know there are like there are some people that will assemble them for you for like really cheap. And for some reason, 
even though every rocketry electronic device I've ever touched was assembled by just some guy who's like an electrical engineer or whatever, uh, when it comes down to that, I'm just like, no, I don't want something that's just assembled by some guy. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I, feel- I know that Adrian from Featherweight is like good at assembling these things because <laughs> he's been doing it for a long time. And like, the Raven is an altimeter that I've like drooled over since I was probably like 12 years old. So when it's him or Jim from Missile Works, I'm like, yeah, these guys know what they're doing. Missile Works has been around since what, like 1992 or something like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I don't know that just like Jim Bob Josiah from Facebook is oh. going to put my, my egg timer quirk together satisfactorily <laughs> to use an invented word like Taylor does sometimes. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, you there's different skill levels of size. Like, I I don't want to look at the altimeter and be able to tell that an amateur put it together. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and for all, I mean, they could come out looking like their factory solder joints and perfect, but I don't feel like taking the leap to explore that when there is so many readily available options. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't want to pay someone else to assemble it when I could just buy a different unit that's already comes that way. Um, It is worth noting, though, that if you are comfortable putting small electronics together, in comparison to buying a pre-manufactured GPS system, the egg finder is basically free. (laughs) Yeah, it's so affordable in comparison yeah i want to say it's like under two i'm gonna have to double check that yeah Yeah. because i think i bought it for matt for christmas or something because i'm like i don't know he can solder he'll probably love this but it was so affordable (laughs) it was like a reasonable christmas present (laughs) right yeah let's see um it looks like the transmitter is 70 bucks or the mini transmitter 75 and the receiver is 35 Plus 55 if you want the LCD. And then, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of components. It can all add up, but like on a very basic level, you could have the whole setup for probably under 200 bucks. But just looking at that pile of unsoldered parts makes me unhappy. <laughs> and so there's a subset good. of people that uh would be the opposite it makes them yeah, very they, happy to oh, just get all like, revved oh, up components <laughs> <laughs> it's basically how we look at rocket kits i guess i just yeah. bought that hawks hobby like big giant astron sprite kit and it came and i was like oh look at it it's so sick <laughs> i think that until i'm like all the way in and on a pro on a pro kit and it's like something's going wrong and then i'm like this is dumb (laughs) (laughs) i don't even like i like i don't even want to build rockets this isn't so how's the bowmark coming then it's coming along quite nicely sitting in the bag still nice yeah (laughs) i have several in its bag i don't want to you know (laughs) take it out and upset it yet right that's like my my two-stage project it's not because i'm scared to try and fly a two-stage rocket and it was expensive and i don't want to destroy it it's just that it really seems to like the box that it's in (laughs) and i don't want to stand in the way of that the Bowmark will let me know when it's ready <laughs> to be <Yeah>. killed. <laughs> Possum, I almost feel like the egg f- timer stuff would almost be up your alley. It kind of surprises yeah. me that you don't have any interest in building electronics. I kind of do, but the main thing is that I don't trust myself. Because like, right. that was like what got me with like car ECUs, like Honda stuff. It's just... It looks fun to an extent. Right. Well, okay, so I I port or chipped a whole bunch of Honda ECUs. Like I I soldered in the sockets, but a Honda ECU's PCB is like 5 by 8 inches and all the components are pretty big. It's a 28 pin <laughs> sock. Like mm-hmm. The altimeters are like the size of the component that I was soldering into a Honda ECU. <laughs> So I'm like, yeah. no, I don't think so. 
uh the egg finder just the like whatever the i don't know the names of the stuff but the like the just dual deploy altimeter the simple one it quark i think quantum maybe right. yeah it's like i guess the more complex the unit is the smaller the components and like the mo- more of tighter they are on the board and stuff so like if you just started with that it would be pretty easy but when i look at like the what is it the quantum or whatever the one that is kind of like the telemega uh, telemet telemega like it does yeah. everything i'm like oh my god you could quasar you could yeah that sounds right i'm like you could not pay me a thousand dollars to uh, assemble that and get it to work like right <laughs> yeah and i it's i I wonder if my dad would be interested. He used to like paint speedometer lines on model cars with toothpicks and stuff. I feel like he could f- handle it. I feel like he would really like it. Yeah, that's insane to me. But um, I guess that kind of already segued us into our next topic of discussion, which is what GPS stuff is currently available or what tracking stuff is currently available. And we're kind of going to run back and touch on Taylor's flub earlier that just derailed the whole (laughs) podcast um but we'll start with gps stuff because there's a couple um that i it'd be kind of fun to talk about why we're disinterested in them um you know we don't want to throw any shade at manufacturers or anything but there are certain things to us that just are not even slightly appealing (laughs) <laughs> and one was we've already touched on was the egg finder and us assembling it ourselves i do have to say as well i know somebody who's got one that was built by somebody else and has had a couple of occasions where the tracking disappeared um so that is a little bit scary and uh yeah that's uh I think we've already covered on how much we're not interested in the egg finder. So let me bring up another one that does exist, is currently on the market, and does not interest me. It might interest <laughs> you, and that's why we're bringing it up. But it is the Apogee Simple GPS. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, it's uh, simple for sure. Um, it's... Uh, I mean, I'm I'm pulling up the page. This is not a professional podcasting experience. A simple GPS tracker. So it's uh just a little it is nice because it's an all in one like handheld device and you know the transmitter looks like it's pretty reasonably sized. It's it's kinda like the simple timer in that it has the weird pre soldered wires just hanging off of it, which makes me a little unnerved. But uh it's just like a little handheld device with an LCD screen and it's got an arrow that you just follow. It's telling you which way to walk. Um, kind of like an RDF tracker, but instead of beeping, it's like a compass. Which I'm the whole appeal of GPS to me is having the exact latitude and longitude that I can just paste into Google Maps. And we've kind of gone down this road where we discussed how dumb it is that i want it to be in google maps and not a native map on an app because like the (laughs) end result is exactly the same and i guess to some extent this is exactly the same thing right uh i just don't want the lcd screen with the pointy arrow if i can't so i don't mind that but i I, if i'm using gps i also want all the other benefit i want it to spit out the coordinates so i can play with them you know right and (laughs) one thing we didn't really touch on a gps is the (laughs) like sorry the aftermarket mapping ability like yeah the the google or stuff with like the graph showing your rocket and where it landed and everything it's just kind of cool and i think that's pretty much entirely ruled out but it is 475 bucks completely ready to go other than batteries says range six to eight miles depending on atmospheric conditions which is interesting and but it doesn't doesn't need cell phone connection which is a big one um you know a lot of actually i don't know if you need an actual 
cell or internet connection. No, I don't think you do because I've seen people use the featherweight ones at Tripoli Vegas and there's flat no service in the middle of that. Like Yeah, the, you don't need cell signal. You just need the um what Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever to connect to the app. Y tooth or blue fi. We're not really big but, technology guys around here. <laughs> but Correct me if I'm wrong. You could get the whole featherweight system for less than the simple tracker, right? Right, which yeah is a detractor there. And uh, that brings me to the next one, which is a very similar solution for a lot less money, the Marco Polo. Um, I don't even know what that is. I hear it a lot. Yeah. I see a lot of like mid-power people using those. Are they affordable? Yeah. I really know nothing about them. Well, they've kind of they've kind of re uh, repurposed it for drone use, and actually, it says no GPS or cell service required, so it might be RDF. But it is basically the same situation. You got a little handheld device, and it's pointing you which way to go. Uh, but hmm. this is two hundred sixty five bucks on Amazon. That's a pretty attractive price. Right, and what's really cool is it's got an integrated LiPo. It recharges with USB. So it is like shoot release levels of simplicity on the rocket so, side. Do you say it's made for, or it's like made for drones? It's like, is yeah, that what so the, original That's what use? it says. I, I mean, I, the reason I know about it is I saw an ad on the Rocketry forum. I feel like it's been around for a while, but it, yeah, it's now like everywhere. It's like drone tracker. I mean, um, I don't know what year it was because, you know, whatever, we're getting old. But I remember showing up to Airfest 2017 or something, whatever. There was one year just like all of a sudden every flight, you know, from a certain uh, line of pads was like, oh, and he's got a Marco Polo on there. And, I, you know, it was Terry LCOing the whole time. So I'm like. I thought he was being funny. Like you say, Marco yeah. Polo. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Which honestly, a great name for a GPS tracking system or tracking system. Um, but it, it actually looks like it is RDF. It says two, ra two way radio system, like a walkie talkie. Hmm. Um, oh no. Maybe it does. Yeah. It, it, it sends a signal every five seconds. So this is an RDF tracker. It's a, it's like a beeper boy. All right, I'm sold. I'm buying five. Um, it <laughs> it looks like it was like originally intended for pets, but yeah, drones and more and RC airplanes and everything. But it does say the battery lasts 45 days. Whoa! <laughs> Holy crap! When so you first actually, said 45, I thought you were going to say 45 minutes. I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> yeah, um, that's kind of crazy, actually. I'm I might have accidentally just stumbled upon a recommendation for next time somebody asks, because two hundred sixty five. Does it say what the range is? Oh, that's what I was looking for. I forgot. I'm such an unprofessional host. Oh, Rocky Let me blogs. See. Ooh, up to two miles line of sight. Mm. Mm. That could get pretty bad if you're in a yeah. in an area with a lot of hills. Um, hmm. Okay, that's. I mean, I guess it's that like explains why it's kind of a favorite of mid power people. Yeah, it's really the perfect tracker for like mid power and stuff. Though that kind of takes place of what we were using, like the personal alarm beeper things back in the day. Because we had to yeah. fly in a bunch of long grass and stuff, and you're like, "Well, I saw where it came down, but we'll never find it." <laughs> yeah, just the super large, loud alarm. Yeah, I had I ordered one from eBay uh, when I was young, not realizing that it was going to take like six months to get it because it came directly from China. <laughs> and then when I got it, it didn't work, so I was not thrilled Sick. with that. Cool. Somehow, my I don't know if they were from dollar stores or what. But my grandpa bought like a hundred of them yeah i do remember there being a ridiculously cheap option and i feel like this isn't one that should be lost on people at this point like if you don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on tracking those things are loud so if you're flying yeah. like not quite out of sight and you'll be able to see roughly where it landed you can hear them from a few hundred feet away like they are loud yeah i remember really pushing the limits of them back in the day you know like 
with the Aerotech Mustang on like a G sixty four, and it it you could just barely like you would definitely lose the rocket. Like you're not gonna you could really just if you know the the wind direction and stuff, you could walk in until you could hear the thing. I mean, it was right. pretty effective because a rocket that size isn't going to land that far away. Yeah. It's funny that you use that as an example though, because I, my Mustang flights and Arcus flights were like all raw G motor flights. I don't know how we got it back every single time. And in fact, weirdly enough, I don't have even one memory of like walking to go pick the rocket up. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember like loading G motors and just like flying Mustangs back to back on G motors. Just make, make your dad go get it. <laughs> there is a possibility that my parents went and retrieved them. I'm not ruling that out. Hey, we'll go a very get a heavy set child. Eat, eat chips. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to sit in the AC and have a Pepsi because. At 15, I weighed 290 pounds, and walking was tough, all right? Is that what you wanted to hear? <laughs> it? just Are funny. you happy now? <laughs> it's, just, it's just funny. I never thought I just had a, never thought of that, and you saying that you don't have any memories to get. I'm like, man, I have a lot of bad memories that go into Get Rock. And you're like, it's slamming G motors and Mustang, and I'm like, man, that goes pretty high. <laughs> Well, the Tripoli Idaho, like that's kind of an ideal Tripoli Idaho launch site flight because it's like it's not going to go past the threshold of where you start running into like barbed wire fences and stuff. If it's a calm day, they were landing very far. And if it was after like all the cattle and stuff had gone through and grazed, it was just flat. So I feel like part of it is that it was just like so uneventful that I don't remember because we were just walking right up to them. That thin Idaho air, man. We could see those things for miles. <laughs> it does make a difference. Taylor was like blown away when I was talking. I don't remember what we were talking. Oh, my five-inch Punisher. No, my four-inch Punisher when it came in ballistic. I was like, yeah, we watched it the whole ride down. And you're like, it went like 19,000 feet. I was like, yeah, we can see it still. I put metallic paint <laughs> on there. It's like, what does that mean? What does that have to do with anything? I don't know, man. I saw it. We don't have that <laughs> dense Missouri and Kansas air out of here. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dude, I remember before we had a tracker, like when we went to um, out west for the first time for LDRS at Gene or whatever, or yeah, um, I was like, this is our, because somehow I knew, I don't know how, but I knew that the air was thinner and I would be able to see it better. Someone must have talked about it in a rocket magazine or something, but I remember thinking, or tell my grandpa, like, this, you know, we'll be able to, I'll be able to fly something really high because I'll be able to see it. We didn't have a tracker. And so I was th thinking up some, you know, I wanted to buy a Cirrus Dart or something and put a J350 in it. But anyway. Yeah, I, uh, we didn't have a tracker either when my dad did his level two, which is insane because my dad did his level two with a four inch rocket with a three grain 75 millimeter L. Yeah, that's crazy. The craziest part of all of that is that it was so windy that somehow it only went like 7,000 feet. And uh, we watched the was whole... Was it a K motor? <laughs> well, it was a caused and slow motor. So there, there was not a ton of impulse to begin with. But it was a 3 grain 75. And it weathercocked pretty hard. Vern Knowles was the LCO and he did wait until we had a lull that was within regulations to launch it. But uh yeah, the nice thing about that was it was so windy. We had a big top flight shoot in there. So we walked right up to it because we could see the wind just dragging it through the rocks and destroying the paint that my dad and I worked on for a really long time. <laughs> um my dad's repainted that rocket like twice. And I'm like, we just need to get like a Oh, that's why it looks so good. Rocket Man or something. Yeah, it's yeah. He's he keeps it nice. It's mm -hmm. like a car that goes into the body shop for shows and stuff like that. Yeah, just get a a recon 50 or 60 or whatever. But uh anyway, should we get back to what tracking stuff is available? <laughs> So wind, wind is our advice. Get a parachute that'll drag your rocket and just look for the parachute. 
put yeah. 80 feet of shock cord in there so it's really high up like a <laughs> kite and then you can just walk straight to your rights every time only fly when it's windy uh, i don't so we touched on the weird ones the apogee gps and the marco polo i shouldn't say weird ones i apologize it's just they're <laughs> weird to us um <laughs> Stuff that we don't use or think about is what he means. Right. We can dive into the Missile Works one a little bit. The T3? Yeah. Is that what it's called? I love Missile Works. I think it's just called the RTX now. Because oh. I think the T3 is now uh, defunct. But I don't know for sure. I love Missile Works. I've used Missile Works stuff for a long, long time. And I really wanted to like the GPS system. It does support the use of mobile apps. The problem is that they don't have one. So you kind of just have to find a generic GPS Bluetooth receiver app. And it just was, it was weird. There was like no definitive way for me to know for sure that I was tracking it. So I like... I d- tried a whole bunch of different apps. I tried it on my laptop. I tried it on my desktop and I like put a battery in it and moved it all over my house and it was updating the location and like tracking where it had gone. And then I got in my car and drove around and got out so I wouldn't be in my metal car and like um, it just stopped working and I don't know why really. So I had one for a while. I had two actually. I got one for my dad as well. And neither of us flew them, and they're they're gone now. I'm actually planning on buying my dad the the featherweight system um, to replace it. I'm really honestly tempted to sell the Altus Metrum stuff that I bought in lieu of getting a featherweight one, but like <laughs> I'm so far in now, and the Altus Metrum stuff, like their native batteries and all this stuff, is super super nice, and like. It really is just boiling down to I'm lazy and don't want to study for a ham license, but like I'm just going to have to unless someone wants to give Bedale 15 grand to certify just the (laughs) the GPS transmitter that I have. That would be great. Let's all go on an Altus Metrum buying spree. We'll just have a deal with him where we just every podcast we plug it till he's sold enough stuff to afford to get the certs just for our own benefit. (laughs) Yeah, I every every other month it seems I I go oh man I want Altus Metrum GPS again and then I look at it and I'm like oh man it's above my my construction brain's capabilities. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I can figure out how to use it. It's just like when I go to the featherweight and look read through that manual, I'm like. Man, this is made for someone as dumb as me. Like, right out of the box. <laughs> just open up the real dumb person phone app. You're like, yeah, it's working. Cool. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. You know, There's going to be a bunch of people that use them now. They're like, wow, okay, I see what I am to you. <laughs> um, Big Red B. You had to be dumb. I said, if you are dumb, it's going to be usable. <laughs> <laughs> If you're accepting that you're dumb, then it's just, yeah, own it and let's go. Um, Big Red B is still around, right? Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Um, They actually have RF stuff, too. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. The one I think that would be useful for us is sold out on the website. I think we've talked about this before. You have to have an actual ham radio to use it, I believe. Right. It is something, is they have GPS stuff as well, and I know a lot of people that, like, this used to be the go-to, like, way back when. It was, like, this and Tragic Little Aerospace. You remember that company? I had one, and I couldn't get it to work. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> they had the first 900 megahertz, I think. Well, Big Red B came out with one at a, at a similar time, I think, but the non-restricted stuff came out, and I bought, because when I built my... uh three inch minimum diameter back in 2014 i was like well if i'm gonna go that high i need gps you know i had that whole thought and then right. i bought it and then when it came time for the flight i couldn't get it co- to connect and so then i basically threw it in the trash and then bad mouth gps for 
<laughs> five <laughs> for ten years till yesterday. And we're getting we're getting over it now, but you know, we're quite bitter. <laughs> um, actually, I just looked at the pricing too. Their nine hundred megahertz stuff, which is not license required, is pretty affordable. Uh, the transmitter is. 210 bucks and the receiver is a hundred dollars um without the lcd with an lcd it is 168 so 368 bucks which again not bad puts you like right up with the the featherweight stuff but it is another option um without the lcd it must be plugged into usb port for power and monitored with a terminal emulator see now we're kind of getting into like the missile work stuff where yeah it's fine it's reasonably priced and it's functional but there is a lack of the the dumb guy simplicity that Taylor is longing for and <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily word it like that but I'm also longing for it hey I'm just saying I'm I'm dumb dumb guy that doesn't you can't use electronics and it works for me so See, and that's, I mean, that's the whole reason I became interested in the Altus stuff as I saw a couple of people using them at Balls. They're like, look, the phone app. And I was like, wait, they have a phone app now? And they're like, yeah, it just works. And I was like, oh, I'm sold. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, I got to study for my AM license. All right, have fun. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, once it's done, it's done, right? Yeah. I'm going to eat so much ham. Uh, oh. <laughs> are you gonna get um, an actual radio so you can do ham stuff no i see i have zero interest and that's why i'm like man i just want the thing about the ham test is it's not hard questions but there's like 10 variants of each question so it's just like reworded ever so slightly to trip you up specifically and the the study guide has like 350 questions, but the test has like 60. So it could be any 60 of this giant pool of the same 45 questions that all have different <laughs> stupid wording to just trip you up about it. I'm like, man, I do not have time for this. It would be kind of fun to have radios. No, oh, he's here it comes. It's starting. <laughs> <laughs> he just opens the closet. There's a CB. Yeah, check it out, dude. If we go right over no, here, we I can mean, talk to we truckers. Could ta we could, yeah, I mean, like, talk to each other at the launch site. Like at times when we went looking for your fusion, <laughs> it would have been kind of <laughs> nice to, you know, let Braden know, like, hey, we're still good. We're just looking. I feel like or, regular like walkie talkies would have passed on that account too, though. We were like two and a half miles. They don't, yeah, they don't work that far. Yeah, I mean, maybe they maybe they have some that do, but yeah, I'm pretty sure I have some cheap ones that are good to like ten. And honestly, what? why don't we start using walkie talkies? We really should because we're always trying to call each other with just like the worst service. Yeah, <laughs> I think and I Matt, bought so need... many for car trips. I know I have a tell bunch Matt kicking around to. Uh, oh, Matt yeah, bought Garmin some... radios. Yeah. <laughs> He bought some cheap ones for us. He thought it was going to be useful for a rally. Like you could use them like a sat phone. And I'm like, dude, it's line of sight. It's not in the woods because it's it said <laughs> they were good to ten miles or something. Hmm. So we need <laughs> to tell Matt to bring those. I do have yeah. like a handheld CB radio too. That is. Uh, <laughs> what I are we gonna do with that? I don't know if it's license free. <laughs> And I've never used it, but I bought it to Let's, see if we could pick up a signal for this event that we're going to where they're kind of underground about what's going on, saying what's happening. And they used to like have speakers where they announced it. It's a whole thing. But I, I it didn't work. I've never broadcast anything on it, which is probably good because it's probably illegal for me to do that without a ham license. But I do own it. Um so if we all got ham licenses, we could have big giant walkie talkies that weigh four pounds and walk through fields of mud with those, which sounds super fun. <laughs> yeah, but if we had ham licenses, we could just get ham radios. It'd be kind of dude, the C four Corvette came with a factory ham radio. Do you know that? It was an option. 
Uh, that's, anyway, that's, sick. Such, that's such a Corvette thing. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Yeah. I want to talk to the truckers. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, I think we're kind of about to stick the landing here on Taylor's point from earlier, and that is uh, alternatives to com spec. But I do want to point out that if anybody has any tracking stuff that we missed here, let's review real quick. We did egg timer, <laughs> the, yeah, the egg timer, egg finder, RDF, the com spec stuff. Abigee Simple Timer, the Marco Polo, Missile Works, RTX, and T3, Big Red B. Um, I think that's it, right? Did I miss anything? Tragic Glitter Aerospace, shout out, the honorable mention, I guess, because I don't think they're still Fluctus. around. Yeah, the Flux. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, right now, um, our biggest recommendation typically is for people to try and find a ComSpec receiver used and then buy a transmitter i'm gonna let taylor tell this actually because i didn't even know about these transmitters till i was introduced to them by him and they are phenomenal um i use the ll electronics falconry transmitters the xlf6 that's the highest power one they have and the six, they make a really six v six volt six v yes yeah, the six yeah, volt because they have an xlf <laughs> four volt as well and three um, um but yeah radio tracking.com is their website which is super easy to remember it? yeah it is hmm. i think huh. now There's you're all... making me second guess it well because i was getting l electronics mixed up with um marshall that's yeah, the other one radio tracking.com is l electronics yeah marshall is also another one though that makes these these are trackers for falconry but you know what i did notice actually what's that um, on the LL Electronics website now, it says uh, Falconry, and then it says like rockets. It says oh yeah, rockets they acknowledge it. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. huh. the Kansas people have been flying them forever, I guess. Um, and they have uh, a whole bunch of different ones as well. They have like little, little, tiny ones with all sorts of different ranges. The only downside is they're quite expensive compared to back when you could get the the lower power com spec one for like sixty five bucks or whatever. Yeah, I think the high power ones last time Wildman was selling them were a hundred, and he used to put them on sale for like seventy five or eighty bucks during the Black Saturday sale. But those days are behind us, and the six volt one is one hundred sixty five, right? One eighty five with the antenna. Uh, with the yes, with the if you want the loaded antenna, which is a little bit smaller. Yeah, um, I don't really. But know these what transmitters it means. are are so small, like they will fit in any rocket essentially. Um, if any of us, all three of us, own one, if any of us were smart, we would have brought one to show to the people that are watching this video. Um, but uh, yeah, That's a good point. Anyway, we don't have one. So you'll just have to take I, our word for it. They are little. I actually, <laughs> I actually just sent two back to them yesterday. Cause they're like, if they're damaged, I like had a couple that were damaged. And I was like, Hey, I emailed them a while ago and asked, are the, can you put a new, like one of them, the threads are stripped on the cap for the battery. And I was like, could you just, put a new case on it and they're like just mail them to us and then we'll see what needs to be fixed and send you a quote so like their customer service seems to be pretty good we'll see how how the end of this story ends up but at least they're like yeah you can just send them to us and i stuck them in an envelope and we'll see what happens and then hmm. there is for those who are coming in completely equipmentless they do sell receivers that are very similar to the Comspec ones. They do, however, come with quite a price tag. So this is where it gets tricky because even when I bought my PR100, I think it was 350 bucks, And then the PR300, which was the one that Tim eventually went on to sell as the Wildman tracker, was 500 So, Postar, what did you pay for yours? Uh, 240 on ebay we, so, so go on ebay right now no matter how deep into this video or podcast existing you're listening to it and go on ebay and type in communication specialists and see if you can find one cheap 
the PR100, the PR300, the low catter is also a PR100, um, which is one that people sleep on a little bit. One of those just sold on eBay for 145 bucks. And then Whoa. we've seen PR100s under $200 multiple times on eBay. Our first recommendation is to try and find one used. But if you can't, um, LL sells the MN10 and the MNS4000, which are $499 and $599 respectively, plus $125 for the, the Yagi antenna. Um, the nice thing about the Comspec ones is that integrated fold-out antenna, but it just... Well, the, res- the MNS4000 has the fold out antenna also oh, it does you're right yeah yeah so it's Six, a similar deal yeah 600 bucks is like this is like i was gonna say this is where it starts becoming how much do i value my rockets for the next handful of years because this is always going to be a simple rdf receiver and transmitter system right we taylor's had his receiver since 2006 Almost 20 years yeah yeah <laughs> i've had mine since 2012 2011 so 12 or 13 they, years. They really don't go bad. And the ones that I've heard of where something did go wrong, I mean, they're so simple. It's like a simple component needs to be replaced. So if someone has simple knowledge of electronics, they could probably figure it out. Like they're not that that complicated. Also, okay, so that's what I wanted to bring up. Um, I hunted down another Wildman tracker because I did not have one until recently. And at the moment, the reason I wanted one was because I would like to start discussing with some people the possibility of cloning it to some extent and making something very similar. And uh, I've also been kind of looking for PR 100s and 300s on eBay so that I can buy another one that can be torn apart for the PC board to be looked at by somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, I'm not saying that I want to be the forefront of a business selling radio tracking stuff because I'm sure there's all sorts of consequences involved with that and FCC regulations and all sorts of stuff that I don't want to dive into. But I do want to have the option to have really intricate diagrams or potentially reproduce even just the transmitters. Um, And there is somebody actually, his name's Alex, he's producing transmitters right now that you can get on the rocketry forum and i have a bag full of them i have like five i haven't flown any of them yet but i would like to but uh yeah i mean a cheap or cost effective to say the bare minimum receiver would go a long way if we could manage to get one cloned and like with 3d printing and stuff like we don't need the fancy aluminum case we just need something functional so if we could just clone the board and figure out a way and figure out all the legal stuff, even if they were like small batch production, it would be nice to have the ability to, you know, keep the RDF stuff afloat to some extent. But it is, uh, you know, maybe a bit of a pipe dream, but I- I'm planning on not flying my wild man tracker if I can avoid it, uh, just in case. So there you go. There's the, the beans are spilled, dude. <laughs> Rocky Vlog starting an RDF radio tracking company confirmed. Oh. No. <laughs> no, that's that is a joke. That's I not what I it. heard. That's not yeah. what I heard. <laughs> yeah, I heard oh. he's gonna have him when are you gonna have the radio stuff ready? Yeah, sounded gonna, serious to me. He's already got five hundred on the way, is what he said, and they cost two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Does he even have licenses to do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is this is why we're not going down that that <laughs> route. Uh, it sounds like we're going down that path to me. <laughs> uh, no, but I'm hoping that somebody can can capitalize on the availability of my stuff to be looked at and um, cloned. I'm not, I'm going to use the word cloned very lightly for legal reasons because you know. <laughs> I don't know what kind of uh, patents and everything were involved. Comspec was a big, big company. Uh, Dude, I think bigger than Matt any of take us realized. His apart. <laughs> well, yeah, that that should go perfectly. 
Um, hey, Matt, you think you could figure out how this works? Or just take yours apart and mess with it. Oh, okay. That sounds fun, actually. <laughs> uh, now it doesn't work. <laughs> What's actually funny, somebody too pointed out, uh, we kind of have made, in our videos, we've made it look really easy to just RDF track a rocket. And for us, me and Taylor in particular, it kind of is because we've done it a lot for a long, long time. But there is definitely a learning curve that really sort of points a finger towards going with GPS as well. Because it's pretty easy to uh, say, I don't know, park your car a mile and a half from where your rocket landed and have to walk <laughs> across five different fields in Kansas because the transmitter was a lot stronger than you thought. <laughs> if you know exactly where the rocket is, that kind of thing doesn't come up. So just uh, take our true. recommendation to spend $800 on radio tracking equipment with a grain of salt. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I have seen some posts from people that are, uh, you know, newer newer to the game, I guess. And they'd, they'd like, I just want to try radio tracking because I've heard good things. And then they're like, wow, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why, and I mean, any, why do people like this? Do you remember the people that lost a 12 foot tall rocket next to us and then yeah. couldn't find it even though they had signal from the flight line? Like I was like, that rocket is in this field and you know, it's no slight against them. They had never used one before, but we were just like blown away that they left and it had a six grain 98 case in it. I was like, there's like three grand sitting out there and they're like, well, hopefully somebody finds it. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> What's your tracker signal? I'm going to go find it. I almost did too, but then I was like, you know, I should probably be looking for my rocket. And then I never found it. I should have done it. Who knows? Maybe they give me a finder's <laughs> fee for tracking their $5,000 worth of stuff down. Maybe. Hindsight is 2020, as they say. But speaking of 2020, let's go to the Patreon mailbag. I that think 2020 is when I started the Patreon. I can't remember. <laughs> Any last thoughts before we go to the Patreon stuff? Um, by the end of the year, I'm going to probably, after I buy my GPS, I'm probably going to make myself look stupid or something and be be all like, I only use GPS now. Yeah. RM <laughs> tracking sucks. Throwing this in the trash. So we'll see how that plays out. It should be fun. It's going to be a classic <laughs> Taylor on the couch thing where he's like, I'll be like, but dude, like, what about when it loses lock? Cause it's going fast. And you're like, that never happens. It always comes back. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a full 180. Um, all right. Andrew Krob says most of what I use is egg timer. I use an LCD kit with a GPS add on. I don't trust. I have access to cell service. It's always led me to my rocket. Oh, that's a good call, actually. The LCD. Um, what? I I assume that means if you use a different configuration, you're required to have phone service. Oh. Um, Interesting. Oh, yeah. I see. With the GPS add-on. I assume that means that you're not relying on your phone's GPS setup. Um, although, I okay, listen. I, I should stop talking. I don't have any idea what I'm talking about. I fly in Arconia <laughs> mostly. Though I haven't landed the dreaded soybeans, so not sure if it will work there. There's a chance to assemble but really enjoy getting it to work. See? Okay, there you go. There's one person who enjoys the process. Um, <laughs> There's one of them. <laughs> yeah. You seem insane to us, but you do you. <laughs> thanks, for be thanks for being on the Patreon, Andrew. Let me just insult you. <laughs> uh, Kevin Osler says, I use the little round trackers from Communication Specialists. They were so easy to use. Too bad they don't make them anymore. I thought about even trying to make them myself at one point. I'm glad I'm not the only one, so maybe somebody will beat me to it. Uh, they're well, the size of a quarter. Luckily, Brayden is working on it as we speak. <laughs> yeah, he said he's Great, doing it go. for sure. <laughs> Guaranteed. Again, five hundred. Email them with way. your pre-orders now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll be like some other rocket companies that took mail-in orders. <laughs> you remember those? They also had motors that were completely exempt from shipping requirements. Anyway, we'll move on. Emma Humphrey <laughs> says, I've been using the Featherweight Tracker. They recently integrated the tracker in Blue Raven phone apps. Yes, so sick. I use the Jupyter Notebook 
to create a KML overlay for Google Earth for the flights. See, that is something that I really just want to be able to do for some reason. Yeah. No, I know yeah, what be... reason it is, actually. It's because Vern used to do it. And, like, Vern was the first person doing that. Everybody was like, whoa, it's, like, overlay the map of where your rocket flew in Google Earth. It's all 3D. And this is, like, standard issue now. But I discovered Vern's website when I was, like, 11. And I was like, this is the most innovative man to ever have walked the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I think that stuff gets, like... That stuff gets so cool when you get like above twenty thousand or near near twenty thousand and above because of the winds aloft and stuff. Below right. that, you're like, I kind of know what the rocket's doing, like just based on where it lands. But like, if you go thirty thousand feet or higher, you know, just as whatever, like your rocket lands two miles away, but in a totally opposite direction that all the other rockets are landing, and then you see it the the map overlay where it does some crazy stuff like right I don't know, that's just like satisfying to see kip's yeah. rocket that was almost to space and the air, the air was so thin that it was just like tumbling end over and yeah. was still going mach 2 or whatever that was <laughs> another Vern innovation i actually now feel bad for not pointing out that one of the available gps tracking systems is kate by multitronics right but i will i will say that it didn't really come to mind because it costs like three thousand dollars <laughs> It is amazing, and you can get the most ridiculous unlimited data, and we've seen, well, we've seen them fly very, very fast without losing lock, very consistent data all the way through, and it talks to you. It was the first one, and Kate holds a special place in my heart because being from Tripoli, Idaho, I got to be at the Tripoli, Idaho meetings where Vern was debuting Kate, like, talking voice the first time. Um. Will I ever be able to afford one? Probably not. But if you do have that kind of money to throw around, it's an amazing system. Um, we know a couple of people that have them. And there's like, you get the pyro boards and everything now. You have a completely integrated dual deploy system that talks to you. It tucks you in when you go to bed. It reads you a story. <laughs> makes coffee in the morning. It's crazy. Um, that's a Terry joke right there, dude. <laughs> He's got a blender on board. Anyway, Alex says, <laughs> I always fly RDF tracking. Sometimes I also fly a GPS. I have a few Comspec trackers that I'm still protecting with my life. I also have a few trackers from LL Electronics that are intended for Falconry. They work great, but the single signal strength can be a bit strong when you get close. For GPS, I've tried a few and nothing even gets close to featherweight for effectiveness and reliability. There you go. First-hand experience. That's what we needed to hear. Uh, UPS Rocket Man says, I use a tracky GPS tracker. Ooh, what All is right. that? I don't know. We're going to look into it. Hold on. It works well enough for Where's now. Where's my tracky at? <laughs> <laughs> this is next to your zippy cup. Uh, it works well enough for now. I'm looking into the egg timer stuff going forward unless I get my hands on a Comspec tracker first. We wish you good luck, my man. Uh, oh, it looks like it's uh, like a, a tracker for cars. Like to keep your car from being stolen it is seven dollars and 88 cents on amazon <laughs> i might have to order one of these and play with it there about is like apple air tags yeah okay so here's the thing subscription needed 4g lte yeah okay so you got to pay a monthly premium to use this but this also might fall into that category that you're technically not allowed to put in a rocket yeah i don't know anything for sure and this guy did not use his real name so what we're gonna do is move on Corey <laughs> b says both have a learning curve it took some time but i've had success with gps i've used big red b missile works rtx and altus metrum with the modern gps chips i've had zero issues once the procedure is dialed in run them next to threaded rod between altimeters and in cardboard base taped to the shock cord no issues I've had momentary signal loss on supersonic flights, but get it back within seconds of burnout, flown them up to Mach 2 and just shy of 30,000 feet. Wow, okay. See, this is the insight Perfect. we needed here. Admittedly, it's yeah, probably you... something I'm doing wrong, but when I've flown RF as backup, I would have lost the rocket without a competent tracker running the receiver. Both require understanding the system and knowing the proper procedures in the field. Yeah, you need, you need one of us. We're... Uh, tracking experts you know we put our ear to the 
to the hissing receiver. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, every time I I try to give someone a one hundred one on RF tracking, something goes really bad. So, <laughs> like what the first time we were going to teach Matt and my rocket got lost, and then the second time we were going to teach Matt and his rocket came in ballistic. Well, no, even before that, the first time uh, Matt ever saw me I, like track something, or I don't know if it was the first time he saw me track something, but I was like, you can go on the tracking adventure with me. That's when I had my, um, I guess it was a good example of showing him how it works, but I tracked my transmitter only oh, two right. miles away. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, see, look, it's cool. You can find the tracker after it went 30,000 feet. Isn't that that was awesome. a bird tracker? So yeah. I guess they're pretty directional. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that honestly was one of the things that sold me. I was like, there might be something to these bird trackers here. Yeah, and, I uh, found mine by itself. Oh, yeah, came off? away from a rocket. But granted, it was like two hundred feet from the pad. Right. Yeah. It, there that tells some you how issues. that flight went. I guess I find yeah. found mine also by itself after it, Wilson shredded his rocket with my tracker <laughs> in it. Yeah. My last flight, I found it by itself without the antenna on it in the middle of the dirt. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that is impressive. It was a hard track with no antenna, but I got <laughs> <laughs> just enough signal. Yeah, I mean, if that's not a testament to the electronics transmitters, I don't know what is. They should be sponsoring this show. But that's it. I just checked the uh, contact at aggpodcast.com email inbox. There's nothing there yet because, you know, we haven't really broadcast it anywhere. Um and that is the end of the Patreon stuff. Let me refresh it one more time. See if we have any new input. No, sir. It looks like that's the end. Does anybody else here have anything to add? Oh, who used to make the store bot beepers? Um, Pratt? Yeah, Pratt Hobbies and Transolve, Pratt right? Hobbies. Transolve? Yeah. Is what, do anyway. you want one? Is that what you're bringing it up? So I don't know. Ship Are they better? Of those? That's what I want to know. Are they better than the <laughs> personal alarm beacons? How could they be? It's probably the exact same thing, right? I don't know. Never I had don't know. one. I, I kind of want the beepers to come back, though, now <laughs> that we've brought it up. <laughs> I, I will say, though, the worst, which happens, seems like always happens, the guy with the beeper this walks would, back with I the mean, rocket. Well, this would have been like my grandpa, but like it, <laughs> the rocket doesn't go very high and it just comes right back in the middle of everything. Oh, and yeah. It's just laying out there, <laughs> just screaming. Yeah. I remember, um, I think it was Airfest the first year my dad and I went in 2012 and somebody had one and he is just like walking across the flight line all the way down with it still going ballistic, oh. just holding the rocket. <laughs> walking all the way down the flight line i was like take the bat my man unplug that i started bringing Dude, the- like wire cutters with me to pick my rockets up because i don't want to listen to the altimeters while i walk for 30 seconds back to my car <laughs> <laughs> or what about have you seen the people well sorry my thoughts got jumbled well, well uh have you seen the people that just leave their altimeters on for like the rest of the weekend they just sort of like bring the rocket back yeah, and lay it down, it down. And then you're like, you're like, is that my altimeter beeping? And you're like, no, it's that guy over there. His rocket's been there for two days. <laughs> we should start doing that with all of our rockets. That way, at the end of a launch, there's just like six rockets. Oh. Just beep, 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 beep. No. <laughs> I'm good. Could you imagine? No, but what I was going to say before that, though, was uh, you... Oh wait, you never had to use your beeper, but <laughs> you're you're getting ready to put it in the rocket, you accidentally pull the pin and it just <laughs> like <laughs> scares you. Dude, I'm also I'm all for the return of like a half a pound of orange chalk powder going in rockets. <laughs> so you can we use oh, that how about- on my dad's level two and the whole fin can just turned pink because it just coated the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, we used to do that with uh our Estes Prowler back in the day. Dude, we should do an episode on like 
old school techniques and electronics and stuff like a, a trip down old school rocketry memory lane how how about um i always wanted to try cold smoke like oh the, the the skydiver stuff yeah like the pole pin ones yeah 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 it goes for like 10 minutes <laughs> they're just super expensive <laughs> I think yeah. that's what uh, John Clifton, that second hole that's in a seven and a half inch uh, oh. corkscrew. That's what that's there for. Would you just tether it to the launch pad, I guess? You would pull it on the way up? I guess so. I think he said he tried it one time and it just like the smoke wasn't thick enough and it didn't it didn't work that well. Hmm. But yeah, I know I know of a guy who also used to use like the actual pyrotechnic ones, like they use for like photo shoots and stuff that are also a pull pin. And you would set it up with like the pin attached to like a D ring on the top of the centering ring. And then on the bottom of the electronics bay was where the smoke canister was mounted. So when the ejection charge fired, it pulled the pin and then it started smoking. So you basically just have a smoke bomb in your rocket? Yeah. <laughs> just like a, a live huh. smoke grenade. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Dude, Okay, if people are still listening, I want you to send to contact at atgpodcast.com your most like ridiculous and creative way that you could think of tracking a rocket without using an RDF or GPS system. I want to see what people come up with. This could oh, be fun. We should kind start of coming up with a weekly prompt. If we got uh, enough ridiculous ones, if we like went to... Um the park or whatever or i don't know we could guess just we could test do it, it, it out. Out. Yeah, yeah go try like, each one yeah <laughs> that would be super fun honestly we got to do more of this um anyway i think that pretty much sums it up right all right yeah, well, i think we're good my name is Braden Carlson. You can find me right here on YouTube at Rocket Vlogs. You can find me on Instagram at Big B. My name is Taylor Jesse, and you can find me on YouTube at The Rocket Channel. My name is Shane or Postar, and you can find me on YouTube at Postart Propulsions. We are the Anti Gravity Group. This is the Anti Gravity Group podcast, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.